of 2018. And by the way, happy belated new year. But also, I'm going to be giving you the best and worst movies of 2018. I'm going to start with the best and with the worst. And usually a lot of people save the best for last, but trust me, the worst segment is probably one of my favorite segments on this show. It's one I've been doing since 2015. Actually, this is my fourth best and worst show, if, if you can call it that. But first, I'm going, to get, get it I'm going to get into what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of 2017. Usually I do this past weekend, but today's a special show, so let's get started. So it shouldn't come as any surprise to anyone that the highest grossing film of 2017 is Star Wars The Last Jedi. That movie has not even been out in theaters for a month, and already, domestically, it has grossed $572.7 million in the U.S. alone. Overseas, it has grossed one point two, or rather, internationally, including in the United States, it has grossed $1.21 billion dollars so that makes it the highest grossing film in the united states but around the world is actually the second highest grossing film the the highest grossing film internationally is the second highest grossing film domestically and that's the only time i'm going to compare ranks for local and international films but the second highest grossing film in the united states from last year was the remake of Beauty and the Beast, which, on a budget of $160 million, grossed $504 million even here in the United States, and around the world it has grossed $1.26 billion. Now, Beauty and the Beast has not gotten perfect reviews. I know some people who flat out hate this movie, but it, you can't deny that a lot of people wanted to see this, and while I didn't hate it, I didn't especially love it, but... <laughs> Apparently, a lot of other people did. So, Beauty and the Beast, second highest grossing film in the United States, highest grossing film internationally in 2017. The number three highest grossing film of 2017 is Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, on a budget of $149 million, has grossed $412.6 million in the United States and a very impressive $821.9 million dollars worldwide. Now, it is quite impressive that Wonder Woman is the highest grossing comic book movie of 2017, at least in the United States. But especially considering the competition it was against, particularly the more established universe franchises like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, and Thor Ragnarok. But yes, lo and behold, Wonder Woman outgrossed all of them, and Justice League, but more on that a little bit later. The number four highest grossing movie of 2017 in the United States, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, another win for Disney. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 on a budget of $200 million has so far, or rather, has grossed. I'm, I'm going to stop saying so far because the only movie that's still grossing so far is Star Wars The Last Jedi. But in 2017, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 grossed $389.8 million. Internationally, it has grossed $863.7 million. So we're not seeing Guardians of the Galaxy going anywhere anytime soon. Will they appear in the upcoming Avengers movie? Possibly, but I really can't say because I don't have any information about that. But here's who will be appearing in the next Avengers movie, rest assured. Spider-Man and Spider-Man Homecoming, lo and behold, is the fifth highest grossing movie in the United States in 2017. On a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has grossed for, excuse me, $334.2 million in the States, and internationally it has grossed $880.2 million. So, of the top five highest grossing films of 2017, four of them are owned by Disney. So, Disney must be doing something right. The sixth highest grossing movie of 2017 is It. The only movie, or rather, eh, well... The only movie on the list that's actually based on a book, if you don't count Beauty and the Beast. But it, on a budget of $35 million, which means it is the lowest budget of the top ten, has grossed a very impressive 
$327.5 million here in the States and $698.8 million worldwide. So very good for it. And we're definitely going to see the second part of it sometime in the future. Maybe not this year, but probably next year or the year after that. Thor Ragnarok, number seven highest grossing film in the United States, which on a budget of $180 million grossed $312.5 million here in the States and $850.3 million worldwide. Now, I'm actually kind of disappointed about the eighth highest grossing film of 2017 because I don't think it deserved to be there. Then again, it's the only movie on the list that I have not actually seen. It is Despicable Me 3 which on a budget of $80 million has grossed, and I kid you not, $264.6 million here in the States. Around the world, it has grossed $1.03 billion. So it has grossed more than both Pixar movies, maybe not combined, but individually. But it, that makes Despicable Me 3 the third highest grossing film internationally. How did that happen? I don't know. Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, the ninth highest grossing film of 2017, which on a budget of 90 to 100 million dollars has grossed 245.6 million here in the States and 525 million dollars so far. And finally, the Justice League movie, number 10 highest grossing film of 2017, which on a budget of 300 million dollars has grossed 227 million here in the States and 652.8 million dollars worldwide. So as you can see, the top 10 highest grossing films are either based on comic books, books, or sep uh, other or are sequels, which has been a common complaint amongst movies nowadays, but apparently, even though it's a complaint, it's paying off. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe... He has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No build joyful smiles by six months is one more sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston, Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and today, Words on Film is celebrating its four-year anniversary. Yes, I, your host of movie critic Dan Burke, has been hosting this show since January 7th, 2014, and what a ride it has been. So much has changed since then. The, the studio that I'm in what wasn't a radio studio when I first started doing this show, but I, have, I am absolutely amazed by how far I've come. So... Today's show is not only to celebrate my four-year anniversary, but it's also for me to list the best and worst films of 2017. So 2017 was, I think, a pretty good year for films. I actually think 2016 was better. But then again, I do have a best list of 2017, which actually was not particularly hard to come up with. So without any further ado, I'm going to start my top 10 best films of 2017, beginning with number 10. Now, there were a lot of really great comic book movies to come out this year. In fact, I think that all the comic book movies in the top ten, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, Thor Ragnarok, they were all great. But I got to give my number ten spot to Wonder Woman. Now, Wonder Woman was a movie that was very much unlike Justice League or Batman vs. Superman in the sense that A, not a lot of people had a lot of complaints about Wonder Woman, and B, it was a movie that really took its time, focused on the story, and in addition to that, had some great characters. There was a lot of buildup to this Wonder Woman movie since Gal Gadot's cameo in Batman vs. Superman, and I think this was well worth the wait. As a matter of fact, one of my biggest complaints with the Justice League movie was that 
it came out too soon. And I think that had the other characters in the Justice League, such as the Flash, Cyborg, maybe even Aquaman, had they been given their own movies like Wonder Woman had, I think the Justice League movie would have been a lot better. That being said, Wonder Woman is so far probably the best sign that the DC Cinematic Universe, rather than being in a rush, might actually turn out okay. In fact, who needs the other members of the Justice League? Wonder Woman can do just fine. But what I loved about it was not only that it was expertly directed, it told an excellent story, but Gal Gadot was fantastic as Wonder Woman. I think she was the Wonder Woman that no one really knew they wanted, but once she appeared on screen, ev everyone pr pretty much, I, I can't generalize what everyone thinks, but I don't even remember have, hearing any complaints about Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. Just a fantastic movie. And even though it's a tough, tough call, I would have to say, judging from my top 10 list, that Wonder Woman is the best comic book movie of 2017, of the several there were. Number nine on my list. I'm going to try to fit in four during this break. So number 10 was Wonder Woman. Number nine is a movie that I haven't reviewed on this show yet, but I will very soon. The movie is The Post. The Post is directed by Steven Spielberg from a story and screenplay written by Liz Hanna and Josh Singer. And it is the true story of a cover-up that spanned four U.S. presidents who pushed the country's first female newspaper publisher and a hard-driving editor to join an unprecedented battle between journalists and government. So the post was made pretty much as a result of the outcome of the 2016 election, especially probably because of the controversy alone with not only Trump's presidency but also the Trump administration's ties to Russia. Having said that, I think it stands on its own as a movie, and the acting is excellent in it. And it certainly makes you appreciate the free press, or at least, you know, if you're either paying attention to the news or are not a member of the Trump White House. And even though you probably, very much like all the president's men, know the outcome of the Washington Post, whether or not they will or won't publish the Pentagon Papers, you're still taken along for the ride, and you still feel the tension of Washington Post uh, publisher Catherine Graham, as well as Washington Post editor Bre Ben Bradley Sr., whether or not y you feel that pressure of them <laughs> and the, the, con con the consequences that might arise from them publishing these papers. And it was certainly a hot topic then. It's still quite a hot topic now. So The Post is a movie that I will review in more detail on a later show. But while I still have the top ten to go through, I'll give you my number eight selection. Number eight on my list of the best of 2017 is An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. This movie was not a box office hit. And it wasn't as big a box office hit as the movie An Inconvenient Truth, which came out 11 years ago, but I thought it was a very worthy sequel to An Inconvenient Truth, and also was a more elaborate documentary with, very much like The Post, a timely message. And I, th and I thought not only was it great because of its message, but it was great because it showed people how much had changed since An Inconvenient Truth, and how much needed to change since its predecessor came out. And I thought one of the best scenes was when Al Gore visited a, a town by the name of Greenwood, Texas, which actually had a mayor that had converted the town's power to 100% renewable energy. And the irony being, uh, s tragically ironic, that the mayor is a conservative Republican. But it j that scene alone just goes to show you that the subject of renewable energy and are trying to save the planet from greenhouse gases and global warming should not be a partisan issue like it is now. And I think Al Gore, again, illustrates that point beautifully. 
and an inconvenient truth, excuse me, an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, is a documentary that everyone should see, which is why it's number eight on my list. And even though this movie did not make my top ten list at all, I have to squeeze in a companion piece to an inconvenient sequel, and that is the documentary Bill Nye Science Guy. See that along with an inconvenient sequel. Maybe see an inconvenient sequel truth first, and then see Bill Nye Science Guy later. They tie in together beautifully. They're two great documentaries, so a little bit of an honorable mention to Bill Nye Science Guy. She made sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run... Uh, oh, that's right. Radio we, show. Right. We have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. The crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's Our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called Fact Up. Up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m., and it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <coughs> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and my first show for 2018. Happy New Year, and I am also giving you my best movies of 2017. So just to recap, number 10, Wonder Woman. Number 9, The Post. Number 8, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Now my number seven pick, which I will reveal for the first time ever. Not even my listening audience on Facebook Live knows this. So, number seven best movie of 2017, Wind River, directed by Taylor Sheridan, who also wrote the screenplay, and it stars Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth o Olsen. And it's about a veteran tracker with the Fish and Wildlife Life Service who helps to investigate the murder of a young Native American woman and uses the case as a means of seeking redemption for an earlier act of irresponsibility, which ended in tragedy. There is a lot to say about this movie. Jeremy Renner is great in it. Elizabeth Olsen is a good supporting actress. And I think it is a movie that pays... <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> this, this studio is not completely soundproof, so whenever an alarm goes by... Uh, unfortunately, or a siren goes by, you guys have to hear it. But anyway, so as I said, Wind River is a movie that takes place in Wyoming, and it is about a murder. It's not the kind of mystery which you follow and you pick up the clues along with Jeremy Renner, who is doing the investigation of this Native American woman. But eventually, I, I think they kind of give up on the clues and just tell you exactly how this Native American woman got murdered. But what that... It being a mystery is not the biggest draw to the film, although people who are in it for a good mystery won't be disappointed. What really sticks out to me about this film is the great characters, the excellent cinematography, and also the appreciation it pays to the Native American people, particularly those of the Pacific West. And I was very impressed by Wind River. I think it's Taylor Sheridan's best movie to date. And it's my number seven pick for best movie of 2017. I'm going to try not to ramble too much. Number six, The Shape of Water, directed and co-written by Guillermo del Toro, starring Sally Hawkins, Octavia Spencer, Michael Shannon, and Richard Jenkins. So The Shape of Water came out a little while ago. I did review this show, this movie on my show. And a lot of people have called it a maybe not modern adaptation of The Creature of the Black Lagoon, but certainly a more contemporary adaptation. But what I liked about it was not only Sally Hawkins' great performance here, for which she will probably be nominated for an Oscar, even though she doesn't say a single word in the movie, but I liked that even though it was a strange 
movie that delved into the macabre. It actually told a really sweet love story amidst its unusual nature. And not only that, but knowing Guillermo del Toro, the science fiction and macabre elements here were taken seriously and also illustrated and with a great special effects team presented beautifully. So Shape of Water is my number six film of 2017. Number five on my list of best films of 2017, The Big Sick. This is a movie where Pakistan-born comedian Kumail Nanjiani and grad student Emily Gardner fall in love but struggle as their cultures clash. And when Emily contra contracts a mysterious illness and goes into a coma, Kumail finds himself forced to face her feisty parents, his family's expectations, and his true feelings. This is a movie that was produced by Judd Apatow and directed by Michael Showalter. I've liked Michael Showalter's films for a really long time, especially his romantic comedies, but I think The Big Sick is a great film and one of the best of 2017 because it is very unpredictable. And I think it deals with a lot of elements and doesn't get overwhelmed or disorganized by them. In addition to that, Kumail Nanjiani, despite having never been the lead in a movie before, I think he's on a, a show right now on HBO, but I, I don't watch very much TV. It's one about Silicon Valley, but again, I, I don't know very much about it, but we're going to see Kumail Nanjiani in a leading role again sometime soon. And I thought the romance he has on screen with Zoe Kazan, who is playing a fictionalized version of his real-life wife, was genuine. And I also loved his interactions after Zoe Kazan's character got sick with Holly Hunter and Ray Romano, who play um, Zoe Kazan's character's parents. In fact, there's a great scene where Holly Hunter and Ray Romano's characters see Kumail performing stand-up comedy for the first time, and they deal with a heckler who's giving Kumail a, a hard time because of his Pakistani background and the whole thing with terrorists. And, and I won't delve into the scene too much because I, I do have another film to get to, but The Big Sick was funny. There were s some scenes in it that were heartbreaking. And overall, it was very unforgettable. So that's why it's my number five pick for 2017. Excuse me. Yeah, number five. All right, number four on my list of best films of 2017, Darkest Hour. This is a movie that takes place during the early part of World War II before the Americans got involved, and it is specifically about Winston Churchill and his decision, his decision whether England should negotiate with Germany or start or enter into the war. And as this movie demonstrates, even though we know the outcome, the decision to enter World War II was not an easy one. And also, Gary Coleman as Winston Churchill was mesmerizing. And this is a, mo this is a role that will surely get him an Oscar nomination, not only because he acts incredibly well at the part, but his transformation into Winston Churchill is jaw-dropping. They could have had another actor like Toby Jones or uh, Stephen Fry play Winston Churchill based on looks alone, n not just acting talent, although those are two very good actors, but Gary Oldman gives his best performance in this movie in a career full of really great performances. And Darkest Hour is a good companion movie to another film that's in my top ten. I'm not going to tell you what place it is. I'm also not going to tell you the film, but if you've been paying attention to the movies that are out, you can probably figure out what movie's going to be in my top three. But again, I'm continuing with my top 10 best films of 2017. I've given you seven out of 10, and the other three. <laughs> hey, everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But it can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments. It doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon. Where the sky is even and gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are plumes. 
to a new Mr. Bear every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access Television, or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I have been giving you my favorite films of 2017. And this was a hard film. Uh, this was a hard list to compile because there were many, many great films of 2017 that I unfortunately did not get to include on this list. I only limited myself to 10 this year. When I first started doing this special show back in 2015, I gave myself a break and gave you the top 12 films of the year. But this time, I'm limiting it to 10. It's it's a tough decision, but again. On with the best of 2017. So just a recap of the films I've reviewed or given you so far. Of the best of 2017, number 10, Wonder Woman. Number 9, The Post. Number 8, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Number 7, Wind River. Number 6, The Shape of Water. Number 5, The Big Sick. Number 4, Darkest Hour. And now, number three, which I'm revealing for the first time ever. Number three best film of 2017 is Coco. Now, I, I guess it goes without saying that Coco is vicariously the best animated film this year, but I think it's an honor it certainly deserves. And the fact that this movie has grossed more than Cars 3, unfortunately not more than Despicable Me 3, just shows how much this movie is connecting with people. So this tells the story of aspiring musician Miguel, confronted with his family's ancestral ban on music, who enters the land of the dead on Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, to find his great-great-grandfather, a legendary singer. This movie is not only significant because it takes place in Mexico during a time when, and a place where Mexico is uh, quite controversial these days, but it also tells a great story about music, family, and being true to oneself. And while that may seem like a cliche amongst a lot of animated films, particularly Disney films, I think it's a subject that Disney Pixar takes incredibly seriously. And consequently, Coco is actually one of Pixar's best films. I can't say whether or not it's better than a lot of my other favorite Disney Pixar movies like Wally -E or Toy Story 3, but it is definitely up there. And the end had me choking back tears. Not only that, but the way the movie is animated, especially when Miguel gets to the land of the dead, is beautiful. I, I have probably not seen a more beautifully animated film in quite a few years. And the effort that Disney Pixar not only put into the story here, which is an original story, by the way, but also the animation was well worth it. I wanted to see this movie higher up in the highest grossing films of 2017, but if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. Ergo, Coco is the third best movie of 2017, according to me. Now on to number two. Number two is Dunkirk. Now, Dunkirk is the true story. Actually, as I said, this is a good tie-in to Darkest Hour because Winston Churchill actually ordered the rescue of the Allied soldiers from Belgium, the British Empire, and, Fran and France when they're surrounded by the German army. And he, he actually ordered the civilian evacuation during this fierce battle in Dunkirk in World War II. It's directed by and written by Christopher Nolan. And again, Christopher Nolan is another director like Steven Spielberg, like Taylor Sheridan, who just keeps directing great movie after great movie. And Dunkirk is probably one of the best war films ever made. I can't say whether or not Dunkirk is better than Saving Private Ryan because Saving Private Ryan is a really tough act to follow, but I'll tell you something. Dunkirk is 
very, very close. And another thing I loved about Dunkirk is not only did it did it have great cinematography and excellent acting, but there weren't any actors amongst the big names in the movies like Mark Rylance and other actors like Tom Hardy who stood out amongst the others. Everyone contributed little by little, and this is probably the movie with the best ensemble cast in the movies in 2017. And also, this movie looks beautiful in 70 millimeter. So if you get to see it that way, I highly recommend it. But if you see it on DVD and Blu-ray, that's okay too. Either way, it's a beautiful movie about a terrible time in history that ultimately probably changed the course of World War II in the Allies' favor. And that's why I appreciate it from a historical standpoint. So... Before I get to my number one pick, I'm going to give you a list of honorable mentions that didn't make the list, but I'll just list them one by one, and I I probably won't get into a lot of detail about what the plot is or whatever, but Stronger, I definitely regret I couldn't get on the list, but I did enjoy it very much. Beatrice at Dinner is a great movie in the Trump age and probably one of Salma Hayek's best performances. Scratch that. Her best performance, period. Dave Made a Maze is a movie that's really quirky, and I loved watching it. I regret that not making the list. Lady Bird is a great coming-of-age movie that, again, has won a bunch of Golden Globes, of how many I, I don't know at the moment, but I also regret not putting that movie on the list. Last Flag Flying... I think it would probably go down as one of the most underrated films of 2017, but I liked it a lot. Steve Carell, Brian Cranston, Lawrence Fishburne, they were amazing in it. I also really loved Get Out. I thought that was the first great movie of 2017. I regret it couldn't make the list. And another quirky one, like Dave Made a Maze, um, Brigsby Bear, which is a movie I felt a little weird about putting on the top ten, but I thought it was quirky and in in a time where people complain there aren't enough original movies, Brigsby Bear and Dave Made a Maze are certainly very original films. And also, A Ghost Story was very original as well. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job. We need a new start, man. You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. <laughs> to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now I've given you nine of the ten best movies of 2017. So before I get to my number one pick, let me give you a list of the movies that I have listed so far. Number ten, Wonder Woman. Number nine, The Post. Number eight, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Number seven, Wind River. Number six, The Shape of Water. Number five, The Big Sick. Number four, Darkest Hour. Number three, Coco. And number two, Dunkirk. Now, if I can afford a drum machine or a sound effect that plays a drum roll, I play it right now. But instead, I'm going to take a very awkward pause. The number one best movie of 2017, according to me, is... Detroit. Detroit is a movie directed by Catherine Bigelow and whose screenplay and story, well, maybe not story, but were written by Mark Bull. 
and it is a movie that is a fact-based drama set during the 1967 Detroit riots in which a group of rogue police officers respond to a complaint with retribution rather than justice on their minds. This movie stars John Boyega, Anthony Mackie, Algie Smith, and also a chilling supporting performance by Will Poulter. And this is a movie I tweeted when I first saw it. It made me sick to my stomach. It most certainly did. But it is also the best movie of the year, I think. Now, I'm trying to take a deep breath and not focus on the fact that Detroit was not nominated for any Golden Globes. I don't see how that is, but it's a movie that I thought was the highest quality and one that deeply affected me the most. I think this movie involves a prolonged police interrogation that you see all sides of the interrogation. You see the sides of the interrogators and the interrogated. And I think you probably side more with the interrogated and you feel their fears, and you certainly can appreciate their tears as well. And it's just a very ugly piece of history that unfortunately is not an isolated incident. So I thought this movie had some excellent performances here. I thought John Boyega made a good leading man, but again, very chilling supporting performance by Will Poulter. And I thought Algie Smith had probably the best breakthrough role in this movie so far. I didn't even know Algie Smith before seeing this movie. Uh, his other acting credits to date include a movie called Earth to Echo, which even though it was done in 2014, I completely missed it. He also played Ralph Tresvent in BET's New Edition story, which of course being on BET was a TV movie. But I was intrigued by his performance in the film, and also not only mesmerized by it, but heartbroken. And this, I, I'm not sure about the time, the timelessness of the film. I'm, I'm sure people can describe it as timeless, but it's also timely, especially given, all, given what's going on in the world right now. But even if this movie came out when Obama was president and not Trump, it would still cut to the core, and it would still maybe even traumatize you a little bit, but certainly Detroit is a film that unfortunately the Golden Globes ignored. My argument is they really shouldn't have. So that is my top 10 list of the best movies of 2017. Whether or not you agree or disagree with me, if you're on Facebook Live, leave comments. I would love to debate this with you. But again, moving on to probably one of my favorites besides the best of 17. Now it's time for Words on Film's Worst of 2017. And this is where I have a lot of fun. Because I think it's more, it's not only more fun, but it's also easier to describe why certain films are the worst or rather than the best. But again, it's one of those things, it's, it's subjective, but it is my opinion, and I hope you'll go along with it. So, worst of 2017. Before I get into the list, I just have to say that I compiled more movies that were in consideration, that I considered for the best of 2017 than the worst. And usually, when I compile the best and worst, it's equal. So, just from... A retrospective, I, I did say that maybe 27, or excuse me, 2016 or 2014 uh, were better f years for films than 2017. But with that said, if I compile a whole list of films that would have been shoo-ins for the best, and I don't have as many as the worst, maybe that means something. But it, it'll be years from now when people finally decide whether or not words uh, rather... A, a particular year is a great year for film or not. It's, it's always a retrospective opinion that is rooted in nostalgia, for sure. But let me get into my best, oh, excuse me, worst films of 2017. And rather than doing a top 10, I'm also going to give you what Siskel and Eber used to do, which is putting the movies into categories. So, 
I'm going to start with the list of epic fails. These are movies that were released as epics and maybe even eventually to tie into a, a, a franchise, particularly like a cinematic universe, but who ultimately failed and probably are not going to recover. So my first list on epic fails is a movie, The Mummy starring Tom Cruise. Now this is admittedly a movie I didn't give my rating a flunk out to, which is my lowest rating. I did give it a strike out, but the more I think about it, the more I don't like it. I did appreciate, admittedly, the fact that they had a female mummy this time rather than a male mummy. I thought that was an interesting twist. And I liked the woman who played the mummy, but I really didn't like Tom Cruise in it. And I didn't like the story. I also didn't like how they hurried up and tied it into a cinematic universe that nobody particularly asked for, and judging from the performance of this movie, will probably never be made. I thought Russell Crowe had a ridiculous performance here as Dr. Henry Jekyll, and this is in a universe where Robert Louis Stevenson apparently didn't write Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. But another epic fail. Su tía que la escuela no era para mí, pero hace un año fui a México y miré muchas cosas que me hizo cambiar mi mentalidad. A los 24 años, yo solo me obtuvo su high school diploma. Mi maestra fue lo máximo para mí porque me ayudó mucho con todo. Nadie obtiene un diploma solo. Si estás pensando en obtener tu high school diploma, puedes recibir ayuda. Encuentra clases gratis de educación para adultos cerca de ti en completatudiploma.org. Patrocinado por el Dollar General Literacy Foundation y el Ad Council. Brian, welcome to the new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering in the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And now I'm giving you my worst films of 2017. Beginning with Epic Fails. I mentioned The Mummy before the break. And the other epic fail I wanted to list was King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. This was a completely flaccid, tone-deaf movie, which promised a good performance by the lead actor who plays King Arthur, whose name is Charlie Hunnam. I just had to look that up really quickly. But this is a movie where Guy Ritchie had the opportunity to revitalize a legend in literature like he did with Sherlock Holmes, but he failed because there wasn't anything particularly interesting about King Arthur in the movie. I think that American audiences nowadays have to be reminded what made King Arthur special. Maybe British audiences don't, I don't know, but my guess is that contemporary audiences, particularly of British millennials, probably do. But you're not going to get that in this movie, and that's why King Arthur Legend of the Sword was a massive disappointment. This is my list of the worst kids' films of 2017. And again, for those of you who missed the announcement, I'm not doing a top ten list. I'm putting the worst movies in categories. And also one thing I forgot to mention before the break that there are two requirements for the worst films of 2017. A, the movies have to suck, and B, I have to actually have seen the movies. So I'm not going to review movies that are by reputation bad. For instance, I heard that the last Transformers movie, The Last Night, and the movie Geostorm were bad films, but I didn't see them, ergo, they're not on the list. So. Worst kids films of 2017. I have two of them. And this is a category I call only if your kids have been bad. I by no means condone <laughs> um, corporal punishment on children, but if they've been really bad, maybe you should let them see these films and they will be begging for forgiveness. 
The first film is Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul. We have a brand new cast in Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and they fail so badly. It's just a series of gross-out jokes and completely unrealistic and far-fetched scenarios. Again, maybe a movie doesn't have to be completely realistic, but I want a Diary of a Wimpy Kid to be at least somewhat of a semblance of what the three last three movies were. Things that were poignantly based on, or rather, about poignant events that could happen in just about any kid's life. You didn't get that in Diary of a Wimpy Kid the Long Haul. You got a bunch of gross-out jokes that would probably only make five-year-olds laugh, if that. The other movie, under the category Only If Your Kids Have Been Bad, is The Emoji Movie. This is a movie that, while well-animated, I will grant you, is a movie that upset a lot of people because its subject was intelligence-insulting and its story was mercilessly ripped from better movies like Wreck-It Ralph or Inside Out. This is what I thought when I saw the movie, and this is what other people thought who I talked to about this film. Not the worst of the year, but certainly a movie that didn't really need to be made. Their emojis, who cares? You put them in text messages, that's it. Don't pretend that they have personalities, or at least if they have personalities, make them interesting ones, not ones we've seen in countless other movies before. So, Emoji Movie, one of the worst films of the year. The next category of worst movies of the year is Don't Remake Good Movies. Now, I will acknowledge that I didn't dislike Beauty and the Beast, the 2017 remake of the animated film by Walt Disney. Now, I will say that it wasn't as good as its 1991 predecessor, but it wasn't terrible. These movies, on the other hand, were terrible. The first, under Don't Remake Good Movies, is Ghost in the Shell, starring Scarlett Johansson. Now, not only is this film the most guilty of whitewashing, where you have Scarlett Johansson in the lead role, it takes place in Tokyo, and you find out that Scarlett Johansson's character actually has Japanese parents. That's bad enough. But in addition to that, you're already remaking a really great animated film, probably one of the best anime films I've ever seen. Plus, I don't remember the story here. I don't remember any lines from it. And all I remember is Scarlett Johansson jumping into rooms through the window, shooting a bunch of people, and taking her robe off. And when she takes her robe off, and this is coming from a heterosexual male here, it is disappointing because it's just all robot parts. So the people who want to see Scarlett Johansson naked are disappointed, and the people who don't feel like it's exploitation, both sides are correct. The other movie in Don't Remake Good Movies is Flatliners. Now, Flatliners was a decent film from 1990 starring Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts, Oliver Platt, Kevin Bacon, and Billy Baldwin. This movie starred a good group of actors, Ellen Page, Diego Luna, Kiersey Clemens, all of whom I like, but Flatliners is flatlined from the beginning. It doesn't do anything really different from the original film on which it's based, and also they tie in cheap thrills as well, making it less of a psychological thriller and more like a slapshot horror movie. So Flatliners is under my category of don't remake good movies. Also, there's a category I have, shameful sequels. Now, one of these sequels is of a great movie. The other is of a terrible movie. I'm going to start with a terrible movie first. Shameful sequels, my first entry in shameful sequels is Boo 2, A Medea Halloween. This is a movie that almost made my worst of the year list because when I reviewed this movie back in October, I ranted and raved about how much it sucked, how much the characters were annoying, and how it didn't need to be made. Maybe I was being a little bit too nice. <laughs> but rest assured, it is a very shameful sequel, and it should have been called Boo 2, Another Medea Halloween, right? I mean, it just seems very logical, but Tyler Perry didn't think of that. And also, I have a theory that Tyler Perry is getting tired of playing Medea. And if he isn't, he certainly didn't show that he has any enthusiasm to play this character in this movie, which is why 
Futu Media Halloween is one of the two shameful sequels that I listed here. The other shameful sequel, I'll tell you in a moment. To buy your home, you became a house hunting ace. Learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. Brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio, that's one word, dot blogspot.com. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing my list of the worst films of 2017, this time under the category Shameful Sequels. Before the break, I mentioned Boo 2 and Medea Halloween. The other shameful sequel to the good movie is Rings. This is the sequel, or one of the sequels, to The Ring. I haven't seen The Ring 2, but I've seen the original Ring, or at least the American remake of The Ring, starring Naomi Watts and Brian Cox. That was a really good movie. I haven't seen the Japanese basis Ringu, but I hear that's even scarier than the American version. But Rings is basically a copycat of The Ring, just in the digital age. And it's not very good. The same plot points happen. And also, the girl who jumps out of the TV set or in the digital age of the computer screen is not nearly as scary as she used to be, basically because she's doing the same things. So it goes, it, it's a coincidence that the worst sequels of the year happen to be either horror films or horror themed. But I also have to mention the worst horror films of the year in a category I like to call. Horrible. <laughs> I won't say that again. But anyway, two entries to this list. The first entry is The Bye Bye Man, a movie that came out last January, exactly one year ago, and was so terrible I had to squeeze it in on this list. The Bye Bye Man is not scary. He has a ridiculous name. He also has a dog, which he doesn't do anything with in the movie. And the film is just terrible because the, the way... The Bye Bye Man is introduced, is completely contrived, and in the end, it's just not scary, it's just laughable. And the other movie under the category horrible, I lied, I said it a second time, is Wish Upon, which is a movie that might as well have been a Goosebumps book. As a matter of fact, uh, R.L. Stein wrote a Goosebumps book about a girl in junior high who makes these wishes and has disastrous consequences. This movie is not exactly like that young adult book, but it is so predictable and so awful that I had to include it in this list. So, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to give you my top two worst films of the year. These are just uncategorizable. So, number two on my list of worst films of the year is Unforgettable, starring Rosario Dawson and Katherine Heigl. I put it at number two because I thought Rosario Dawson was good in the film, but man, Katherine Heigl, good God, she was absolutely awful. She turned in a performance that was probably worthy of a lifetime film, but not a mainstream film. She was so tacky, and she, not only did she bring the whole movie down, but also the story was incredibly predictable. But Unforgettable is not forgettable per se as I thought it would be because I still remember it months after seeing it as one of the worst films of the year. It was so laughably bad and Rosario Dawson even though she did well with what she was given the problem was she wasn't given enough and I know she's going to do a better movie in the future but in the meantime Unforgettable was just bad. Now the worst film of the year is one that did have big name stars in it 
that I've seen in much better films. So, here it is, worst film of the year. Imaginary drum roll, please. The worst film of 2017, according to me, is Baywatch. Baywatch is a movie that is, of course, based on the TV series that was campy drama, as it was. And you would think that Baywatch would be easy to make fun of, but as this movie demonstrates, Baywatch makes fun of itself, the TV series makes fun of itself better than this movie ever could. In addition to that, the six main characters were just stereotypes. You had Zac Efron as the cocky, good-looking guy, and Dwayne Johnson as the team player. And pretty much the dialogue was so uninspired that I could have sworn that Zac Efron said at one point, you know, I play by my own rules. And Dwayne Johnson said, no, that's not the way you do it. This is a team you're, you're being a part of. Well, if it's a team he's being a part of, why did you recruit him? Why? And I was also disappointed by the fact that the three women who were also lifeguards had no personalities whatsoever. They were just big stereotypes. And there was also one guy with curly hair who was kind of a Seth Rogen or a Jonah Hill wannabe. I didn't like him either. So Baywatch, worst film of 2017, according to Words on Film. So that was the best and worst of 2017 for, uh, that was my special show for 2017. Happy 2018, everyone. And I will be back next week with actually a special segment, which is a memo to the Academy. These are performances that I think the Academy should take into consideration. In the meantime, thank you so much for tuning into Words on Film. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, going four years strong and counting. So I just want to say, this is Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies. <laughs>